The Lancashire Witches by Harrison Ainsworth, the classic tale of the supernatural. I tell thee, thou liest, false knave, cried the abbot, striking him on the hand with his scourge. Quit thy hold, and let me go. Not till I have done, replied M.D., maintaining his grasp. Abbot of Worley, thou art no longer. Thy possessions will be taken from thee, and if thou returnest, thy life also will be taken. And if thou fleest, a price will be set upon thy head. I can alone say thee, and I will do so on one condition. Condition, make conditions with thee, bond slave of Satan, cried the abbot, gnashing his teeth. Stand aside, or I will strike thee dead. You are wholly in my power, cried M.D. with a disdainful laugh, and as he spoke, he pressed the large sharp bit against the charger's mouth, and backed him quickly to the very edge of the hill, the sides of which were slowed precipitously down. William Harrison Ainsworth was born in Manchester in 1805, and went to Manchester Grammar School. He was article to a solicitor, who became a novelist. He died in 1882. The Lancashire Witch Introduction The Last Abbot of Worley Chapter 1 The Beacon on Pendle Hill There were eight watches by the beacon on Pendle Hill in Lancashire. Two were stationed on either side of the northeastern extremity of the mountain. One looked over the castled heights of Cliveroe, the woody eminences of Orland, and bleak ridges of Ornley, the broad moors of Leesdale, the trough of Bollard and Ulfright, and even brought within his ken the black bells overhanging Lancaster. The other tracked a stream called Pendle Water, almost from its source amid the neighbouring hills, and following its winding through the leafless forest until it unites its waters to those of the colder and swept on in swifter and clearer current to wash the base of Worley Abbey. But the watcher's survey did not stop there, noting the sharp spire of Burnley Church relieved against the rounded masses of timber constituting Townley Park as well as the entrance of the gloomy mountain gorge known as the Grange or Cliviger. His far-reaching gaze passed over Todmorden and settled upon the distant summit of Blackstone Edge. Dreary was the prospect on all sides, Blackmoor, bleak fell, straggling forest, intersected with sullen streams as black as ink, with here and there a small town or moss wall with waters of the same hue. These constituted the chief features of the sea. The whole district was barren and thinly populated. Of towns only Cliveroe, Cone and Burnley, the latter little more than a village were in view. In the valleys there were a few hamlets and scattered cottages, and on the uplands an occasional booth, as the hut of the herdsmen was termed, but of more important mansions there were only six, as Merley, Twistleton, Alconcourt, Saxwell, Iton Hill, Gore for the vaseries for the cattle of which the herdsmen had care, and the lawns or parks within the forest, attaining to some of the halls for mention, offering the only evidences of cultivation. All else was healthy waste, morass, and wood. There were eight watchers by the beacon, two stood apart from the others, looking to the right and the left of the hill. Both were armed with swords and arquebuses, and wore steel caps and coats of Their sleeves were embroidered with the five wounds of Christ, encircling the name of Jesus, the badge of the pilgrimage of grace. Between them, on the verge of the mountain, was planted a great banner displaying a silver cross, the chalice and the horse, together with the classical figure but wearing a helmet instead of a mitre, and holding a sword in place of a crossier, with the unoccupied hand pointed to the two towers of a monastic structure, as if to intimidate that he was armed for his defence. This figure, as the device, need be sure, represented John Paslow, Abbot of Warley, or as he styled himself in his military capacity, Earl of Poverty. Near them stood a broad-shouldered, athletic young man with a fresh complexion, curling brown hair, light eyes, and open Saxon countenance, best seen in his native country of Lancaster. He wore a Lincoln green tunic with a bugle suspended from the shoulder by a silken cord and a silver plate engraved with the three looses that ensigned the Abbot of Warley hung by a chain from his neck. A hunting knife was in his girdle and an eagle plume in his hat, and he leaned upon the butt end of a crossbow, regarding three persons who stood together by a pea fire on the shelter side of the beacon. Two of these were elderly men in the white gown and scaffold of Sister Seen Monks, doubtless from Warley, as the Abbey belonged to that order. Third and last, and evidently their superior, was a tall man in a riding dress, wrapped in a long mantle of black velvet, trimmed with maneuver, and displaying the same badges as those on the sleeve of the sentinel, only wrought in richer material. His features were strongly marked with stern and bore traces of age, but his eye was bright, and his carriage erect and dignified. The beacon near which the watchers stood consisted of a vast pile of logs and timber, heaped upon a circular range of stones with open into admit air, and having the centre filled with faggots and other quickly combustible materials, torches were 
place near at hand so that the pile could be lighted on the instant. The watch was held one afternoon at the latter end of November 1536. In that year had arisen a formidable rebellion in the northern countries of England, the members of which were engaging to respect the person of King Henry VIII and his issue bound themselves by solemn oath to accomplish the restoration of papal supremacy throughout the realm and the restitution of religious establishments and lands to their late dejected possessors. They bound themselves also to punish the enemies of the Romish Church and suppress hearsay. From its religious character, the insurrection assumed the name of the Pilgrimage of Grace and numbered among its adherents all who had not embraced the new doctrines in Yorkshire and Lancashire. That such an outbreak should occur on the suppression of the monasteries was not marvellous. The desecration and spoliation of so many sacred structures, the destruction of shrines and images long regarded with veneration, the ejection of so many ecclesiastics renowned for hospitality and revered for piety and learning, the violence and rapacity of the commissioners appointed by the vicar General Cromwell to carry out these severe measures. All these outrages were regarded by the people with abhorrence and disposed them to aid the sufferers in resistance. As yet, the wealthier monasteries in the north had been spared and it was to preserve them from the greedy hands of the visitors, Doctors Lee and Layton, that the insurrection had been undertaken. A simultaneous rising took place in Lincolnshire, headed by Mackerel, Abbot of Arling, for it was speedily quelled by the vigour and skill of the Duke of Suffolk and its leader executed. But the northern outbreak was better organised and a great force, and it was now numbered 30,000 men under the command of a skillful and resolute leader named Robert Askett. As may be supposed, the priesthood were main movers in a revolt having their especial benefit for his aim, and many of them, following the example of the Abbot of Arling, clothed themselves in steel instead of woolen garments, and girded on the sword and the breastplate for the red dress of their grievances and the maintaining of their rights. Amongst these were the abbots of Jervos, Furness, Fountains, Revolts, and Sally, and lastly the abbot of Warley. Before mentioned, a fiery and energetic prelate who had ever been constant and determined in his opposition to the aggression measures of the king. Such was the pilgrimage of grace, such its design, and such its forces. Several large towns had already fallen into the hands of the insurgents. Yorkville and Pontefract had yielded. Skipton Castle was besieged and defended by the Earl of Cumberland, and the battle was offered to the Duke of Norfolk and the Earl of Shrewsbury, who headed the King's forces at Doncaster. But the object of the royalist leaders was to temporise, and an armistice was offered to the rebels and etc. Terms were next paused and debated. During the continuance of this armistice, all hostilities ceased. The beacons were reared upon the mountains, and their fires were to be taken as a new summons to arms. This signalled the eight watchers expected. Though late in November, the day had been unusually fine, and in consequence the whole hilly ranges around were clearly discernible. But now the shade of evening was fast drawing on. Night is approaching, cried the tall man in velvet mantle impatiently, and still the signal comes not. Wherefore this delay? Can not have accepted our conditions? Impossible. The last messenger from our camp at Scorsbeck, please, was brought word that the Duke's sole terms would be the King's pardon to the whole insurgent army, provided they at once disperse, except ten persons, six names, and four unnamed. And were you amongst those named, Lord Abbot demanded one of the monks. John Porsley, Abbot of Warley, it was said, head of the list, lied the other, with a bitter smile. Next came William Trawford, Abbot of Sally. Next Adam Sudbury, Abbot of Jervox. Then our leader, Robert Ass, then John Eastgate, Monk of Warley. Our Lord Abbot, exclaimed the monk, was my name mentioned. It was rejoined the Abbot, and that of William Haydar, also Monk of Warley, closed the list. The unrelenting tyrant muttered over monk, but these terms would not be accepted. Assertively not, replied hoarsely. They were rejected with scorn, but the negotiations were continued by Sir Ralph Ellica and Sir Robert Bowers, who were to claim on our part a free pardon for all. The establishment of a parliament and court of justice at York, the restoration of Princess Mary to the succession, the people to his jurisdiction, and our brethren to their houses, but such conditions still never be granted. With my consent to armistice should have been a need to, we are sure to lose by the delay, but I was overruled by the Archbishop of York and the Lord of Darcy. Their voices prevailed against the Abbot of Warley, or it is the Earl of Hobbiter. It is the assumption of that derisive title which was drawn upon you for the full force of the King's resentment. Lord Abbot observed Father Eastgate. It may be, replied the Abbot, I took it in mockery of Cromwell and the ecclesiastical commissioners, and I rejoice that they have felt this thing. The Abbot of Berlin's called himself Captain Cobbler, because as he affirmed, the state wanted mending like old shoes.
It is not my title, equally well chosen. It's not the church smitten half of it. Have not 10,000 of our brethren been driven from their homes to beg or to starve? Have not the homeless poor, whom we fed at our gates and lodged within our wards, gone away hungry and without rest? Have not the sick, whom we would have relieved, died untended by the hedge side? I am the head of the poor in Lancashire, the redresser of their grievances, and therefore I style myself Earl of Poverty. Have I not done well? You have, Lord Abbot, replied Father Eastgate. Poverty will not alone be the fate of the church or of the whole realm. If the rapacious designs of the monarch and his heretical counsellors are carried forth, pursue the abbot, Cromwell, orderly, and rich have wisely ordained that no infant shall be baptised without tribute to the king, that no man who owns not above twenty pounds a year shall consume wheat and bread, or eat flesh of owl, or swine without tribute, and that all ploughed land shall pay tribute likewise. Thus the church is to be beggars, the poor plunders, and all men were plunders, fatten the king and fill his exchequer. This must be a jest, observed Father Haydock. It is a jest no man laughs at, rejoining the abbot sternly. Any more than the king's counsellors will laugh at the Earl of Poverty, whose title they themselves have created. But wherefore comes not the signal? Can aught have gone wrong? I will not think it the whole country, from the Tweed to the Humber, and from the Loon to the Mercy, is ours. And if we but hold together, our cause must prevail. Yet we have many and powerful enemies, observed Father Eastgate, and the king, it is said, have sworn never to make terms with us. Tidings were brought to the Abbey this morning that the Earl of Derby is assembling forces at present to march upon us. We will give him a warm reception if he comes, replied Horsley fiercely. He will find that our walls have not been crenelled and embattled by license of good King Edward III for nothing, and that our brethren can fight as well as their predecessors. For in the time of Abbot Holden, when they took tithe by force from Sir Christopher Parsons, of Slaber. The abbey is strong and right well defended, and we need not fear a surprise. But it grows dark fast, and yet no signal comes. Perchance the waters of the Don have again risen, so as to prevent the army from fording the stream, observed Father Hader, or it may be that some disaster has befallen our leader. Nay, I will not believe the latter, said the abbot. Robert Ask is chosen by heaven to be our deliverer. It has been prophesied that a worm with one eye shall work the redemption of all in fear, and you know that Robert Ass have been deprived of his left ball by an arrow. Therefore it is observed of the ECA that the pilgrims of grace chant the following ditty. Fourth shall come in Ass with one eye, he shall be chief of the company, chief of the northern chivalry. What more demanded the abbot seeing that the monk here to hesitate? Nay, I know not whether the rest of the rams may be you, Lord Abbot, replied of the ECA. Let me hear them and I will judge you, said Horsley. Thus urged the monk went on. One shall sit at a solemn feast, half warrior, half priest. The greatest they shall be the least. The last verse, observed the monk, has been added to the ditty by Nicholas M.D. I heard him sing it the other day at the Abbey Gate. What Nicholas M.D. of Warson, cried Abbot, he whose wife is a witch, the same replied Eastgate. Oh, be so sworn to show, you know, remarks the forester, who had been listening attentively to their discourse, and who now set forward. Though dunna your think it be, let me the Lord Abbot. Best M.D. is too young and too frotty for a witch. Thou art bewitched by her thyself, but said the Abbot. Angrily, I shall impose a penance upon thee to free them from all evil influence. Thou must recite twenty paternosters daily, fasting for one month, and afterwards form a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Gilsland, best MD, as an approved and notorious witch, and have been seen by credible witnesses attending a devil's Sabbath on this very hill. Heaven shield us. It is therefore that I have placed her and her husband under the ban of the church, pronounced sentence of the excommunication against them, and commanded all my clergy to refuse baptism to their infant daughter newly born. Was me in cannot speak real of Lord Abbot replied Ashby, and best text to sentence so to earth, then let her amend her ways, or heavier punishment will be fallen, cried Horslew severely. Sorti elgum non patiris vivera, save the Levitical law. If she be convicted, she shall die the death. That she is comely, I admit, but it is the comeliness of a child of sin. Dost thou know the man with whom she is wedded, or supposed to be wedded, for I have seen no proofs of the marriage. He is a stranger.
stranger here. He knows no about him, Lord Abbott. Said that he come to Pendle a twill month ago, replied Ashby. But he knows full well that you weren't coming. Robbed me of the prettiest latch lass in Lancashire. I or I England and sure. For the matter of that, what manner of man is he? Inquired the Abbot. Or oh, is a vertiki, a very vertiki, replied Ashby. We are fierce as flat as a bogger, sooty, shiny, hurry like a modern wall, and he looks like a staniel, both from running, roasting, and throwing its stern is no match I this country. I tried him at three guns, so he can't speak. For the most part, he's a big black bandyhuit with him, and by the mess, he kind of help thinking he's may free sometimes with your lordship. But had this must be Lusu, cried Abbot. You say you know not where and see comes this strange. T Miss Mariner call the board, no question. Odd rotten him, replied Ashby. He answers we a gab or a quack of his staff. On he least sees him, he threatened and rattled me bones with. For his sort lowers him peg. We will find a way of making him speak, said Abbot. He can speak and write well if he pleases, remarked Father Eastgate. For thou ordinarily silent and sullen enough, yet when he doth talk, it is not like one of the hinds with him who he consorts, but in good set rays, and his bearing is as bold as that of one who hath seen service in the field. My curiosity is aroused, said the abbot, I must see him. No sooner said than done, cried Ashby, for be the Lord Harry, he see him standing, be your Moscow on top of the hill, through how he's getting there, she done it only knows, and he pointed out a tall dark figure standing near a little pool on the summit of the mountains, about a hundred yards from there. Talk of ill and ill come of observe father here, and see the wizard have a black hound with him, and maybe he's white in that likeness. <coughs> now he knows not reap wheel, father hater, replied the forester. It's a saint Hubert, and a rear run for fox or badger. Odds life a favour, whom that's a black bandy who it I was speaking on. I like not the appearance of the knave at this juncture, said the abbot, yet I wish to confront him and charge him with his misdemeanours. Hark he sings, cried father hater, and as he spoke, a voice was heard chanting. One shall sit at a solemn beast, our warrior, our priest. The greatest there shall be the least. The very ditty I heard, cried Father Eastgate, but list he has more of it, and the voice resumed. He shall be rich, yet poor as me, Abbot the Earl of Poverty. Monk and soldier, rich and poor, he shall be hanged at his own door. Loud, derisive laughter followed the song. By Our Lady of Warley, the knave is mocking us, cried Abbot. Send a bolt to silence him, cover. The forester instantly bent his bow, and a quarrel whistled off in the direction of the singer. But whether his aim were not truly taken, or he meant not to hit the mark, it is certain that them died remained untouched. The reputed wizard laughed aloud, off his felt cap in acknowledgement, and marched deliberately down the side of the hill. Thou art not warned to miss thy aim, Cuffer, cried the abbot with a look of displeasure. Take good heed, thou producest this soul knave before me when these troublous times are over. But what is this he starts? Ah, he is practising his devilries on the mountainside. It would seem that the abbot had got warrant for what he said, as them be having paused at a broad green patch on the hillside was now busied in tracing a circle around it with his staff. He then spoke aloud some words, which the superstitious beholders construed into an incantation, and after tracing the circle once again, and casting some turfs of dry heather, which he put from an adjoining hill lot on three particular spots, he ran quickly downwards, followed by his hound, and leaping a stone wall surrounding a little orchard at the hill, disappeared from view. Go and see what he had done, cried Abbot to the forester, for I like it not. As he instantly obeyed, and on reaching the green spot in question, shouted that he could discern nothing but presently added as he moved about that his herb heaved like a sway bed beneath his feet, and he thought to use his own basology, wood brass. The abbot then commanded him to go down to the orchard below, and if he could find Demdi to bring him to him instantly, the forester did as he was bidden, ran down the hill, and leaving the orchard wall as the other had done, was lost to sight. Ere long it became quite dark, and as Ashi did not reappear, the abbot gave vent to his impatience and uneasiness, and was proposing to send one of the herdsmen in search of him. When his attention was suddenly diverted by a loud shout from one of the sentinels, and a fire was seen on a distant hill on the right, the signal, the signal cried for salute joyfully, kindle a torch quick, quick, and as he saw, he sees a brand and pushed it into the key fire. While his example was followed by the two monks, it is the beacon on the Blackstone Edge, cried the abbot, and look, a second blazes over the Grange of Glibiger, another on Eisen Hill, another on Bolswell Hill, and the last on the neighbouring heights of Padium. Our own comes next to me, like the enemies of our holy church to perdition. With this, he applied burning brand to the combustible matter of the beacon. The monks did the same, and 
an instant of tall pointing flame rose up from a big cloud of smoke. Here another minute had elapsed, similar fires shot up to the right and the left on the highlands of Trojan Forest, on jagged points of orage on the summit of Cowling Hill and on to Sitton. Other fires again blazed on the towers of Cliverow, on Mogridge and Richester, and on woody eminences of Bowling, on Woolcrag and on the Bell and Saw all the way to Lancaster. It seemed the work of enchantment so suddenly and so strangely did the fires shoot forth. As the beacon flame increased it lighted up the whole of the extensive tableland on the summit of Pendlewell, and a long lurid street fell on the darkening moss wall near the wizard standing spot. But when it attained its utmost height it revealed the depths of the forest below, and a red reflection here and there marked the course of Pendle water. The excitement of the abbot and his companions momentarily increased, and the sentinels shouted as each new beacon was lighted. At last almost every hill had its watchfire, and so extraordinarily was the speckle that it seemed as if weird beings were abroad and holding their revels on the heights. Then it was that the abbot mounted his seat called out to the most holy fathers you will follow to the abbey as you may. I shall ride fleetly on and dispatch two hundred archers to Huddersfield and wait you. The abbots of Sally and Jervas with the prior of Burlington will be with me at midnight and at daybreak we shall march our horses join the main army. Heaven be with you. Stay, cried a harsh imperious voice. Stay. And to his surprise the abbot beheld Nicholas M.D. standing for him. The aspect of the wizard was dark and forbidding and seen by the beacon light his savage eager blazing eyes all gone brave and fantastic arm and made him look like someone in the river. Flinging his staff over his shoulder he slowly approached and his black hand followed close by his heel. I have a portion to you Lord Abbot he said I hear me see before you set out of the abbot or I will before you. I will before me I listen to thee thou wilt show cried Abbot what hast thou done with her I see. I have seen nothing of him he sent a bolt after me. At your bidding, Lord Abbot, replied M.D., beware lest any harm come to him, or thou wilt do a cry for you, for I have no time to waste on thee. Farewell, Arthur. My mass will be said in the country church, for we set out on the expedition tomorrow morning. You will both end it. You will never set out on the expedition, Lord Abbot, cried M.D., planting his staff so soon into the ground for the horses there, that the animal reared and nearly drew his rider. How now, fellow, what means you? cried the abbot furiously. To warn you, replied M.D. Stand aside, cried the abbot, stirring his seat, or I will trample you beneath my horse's feet. I might let you ride to your own doom, rejoined M.D. with a song of laugh as he sees the abbot's bridle. But you shall hear me, I tell you, you will never go forth on this expedition. I tell you that here tomorrow, Wally Abbey will have passed forever from your possession, and that if you go thither again, your life will be forced. Now will you listen to me? I am wrong in doing so, cried the abbot. He could not, however, have repressed some feeling of misgiving at this alarming address. Speak, what would you say? Come out of earshot of the others, and I will tell you, replied M.D. And he led the abbot's horse to some distance further on the hill. Your cause will fail, Lord Abbot, he then said. Nay, it is lost already. Lost, cried the abbot, out of all patience. Lost, look around. Twenty fires are in sight. A thirty in every fire that thou seest will summon a hundred men at least to arm. Before an hour, five hundred men will be gathered for the gates of all the abbot. Replied M.D., but they will not own the Earl of Hobbardale or their leader. What leaders will they own then? demanded the abbot scornfully. The Earl of Derby, replied M.D., he is on his way thither with Lord Mountain Eagle and Preston. Ha! exclaimed Parsley. Let me go meet them then. But thou trifest with me, fellow. Thou canst know not in this. When scotting thou thine information, need it not reply you, but thou wilt find it correct. I tell thee, proud abbot, that this grand scheme of thine and of thy fellows all the restitution of Catholic Church has failed, utterly failed. I tell thee thou liest false near cried Abbot, striking him on the hand with his sword. Quit thy hold and let go. Not till I have done, replied empty, maintaining his grasp. Well hast thou styled thyself early poverty, for thou art poor and miserable in the abbot of war, that thou art no longer thy possession will be taken from thee. And if thou return and thy life also will be taken me, thou be as the set on thy head. I can alone say thee, and I will do so on the condition. Condition, no conditions with thee. Bond slave of Satan, cried the abbot, gnashing his teeth. I reproach myself that I have listened to thee so long. Stand aside, or I will try thee dead. You are wholly in my power, cried him with a disdainful laugh, and as he spoke, he pressed a large sharp bit against the large mouth, and backed him quickly to the very edge of the earth, the sides of which he had sloped precipitously down. The abbot would have uttered a cry, but surprise and terror kept him silent. Were it my desire to injure you, I would cast you down the mountainside, certain death pursued MD, but I have no such wish. 
On the contrary, I will serve you as I have said in one condition. Thy condition will imperil my soul, said I have little of wrath no longer. Thou seekest in vain, terrify me in complacence. Bay thee, retro, saffiness. I defy thee and all thy words. Them be the last song for the hundreds of the church in crying me. Cry, but look, he added, doubted my word that I told you. Rising was at an end. The beacon fires on Bulls were ill, and on the range of Livinger are extinguished. That on Padium Heights is expiring. Nay, it is out. And ere many minutes, all these mountain watchfires will have disappeared like lamps at the doors of a feast. By our lady, it is so, cried the abbot in increasing terror. What new jugglery is this? It is no jugglery, I tell you, replied the other. The waters of the dawn have again risen. The insurgents have accepted the king's pardon, have deserted their leaders, and dispersed. There will be no rising tonight or on the morrow. The abbot so Thou playest is lost. Thirty years hast thou governed here. Thy rule is over. Seventeen abbots have been of Whaley. The last thou, but there shall be no more. It must be even in person that sees us being by the abbots. His hair bristling on the bed. Cold perspiration bursting from his own. No matter who I am, but I have said I will aid and honor the mission. I am baptized her infant daughter, and I am content. I would not ask thee for this service, slight though it be, but the poor soul hath set her mind upon it. Will thou do it? Nor replied Abbot, shuddering, I will not baptize the daughter of Satan. I will not sell my soul to the powers of darkness. I adjure thee to depart from me and tempt me no longer. Vainly thou seekest to cast me off. Rejoin in them thy what if I deliver thine adversaries into thine hands and revenge thee upon them. Even now there are a party of armed men waiting at the foot of the hill to seize them and thy brethren. Shall I show thee how to destroy them? Who are they? demanded the abbot, surprised. Their leaders are John Bradill and Richard Ashton, who shall divide Wally Abbey between them if thou sayest them not to them thee. Hell consume them, cried the abbot. Thy speech shows consent, rejoined them thee. Come this way. And without awaiting the abbot's reply, he dragged his horse towards the end of the mountain. As they went on, the two monks who had been filled with surprise at the interview, though they did not dare to interrupt it, advanced towards their superior and looked earnestly and inquiringly at him, but he remained silent, while to the men at arms and the herdsmen who demanded whether their own beacon fire should be extinguished as others had been, he answered moodily in the negative, where are the balls you spoke of, he asked, with some uneasiness, as MD led his horse slowly and carefully down the hillside, you shall see anon, replied over, you are taking me to the spot where you trace the magic circle, cried Hosslew in alarm, I know it from its unnaturally green view, I will not go thither, I do not mean you should look Lord Abbot replied, M.D. halting. Remain on this firm ground, nay. Be not alarmed. You are in no danger. Now bid your men advance and prepare their weapons. The Abbot would have demanded wherefore, but at a glance from them he complied, and the two men at arms and the herdsmen arranged themselves beside him, while Father Isier and Hadar, who had got upon their mule, took up a position behind. Scarcely were they thus placed when a loud shout was raised below, and a band of armed men to the number of thirty or forty left the stone wall and began to scale the hill with great rapidity. They came up a deep dry channel, apparently worn in the hillside by some former torrent, and which lay directly to the spot where Demdi and the abbot stood. The beacon fire still blazing brightly, the illuminated proceedings showing that these men from their accountments were royalist soldiers. Stir not as you value your life, said the wizard to Hoslu, but observe what shall follow.